Thank you everybody for joining me uh, today. What we're going to be talking about is uh, Stellar Evolution. Uh, and I titled the talk Stellar Evolution for Beginners uh, only because I am not a heliophysicist, so I can't do the super advanced stellar evolution, uh, but hopefully we'll get through this together. Uh, I do welcome questions. We'll have some time towards the end also for questions, but if something hits you right away and you just have to ask, just throw a hand up and get my attention and I'll be happy to, to stop and answer that way. That's fine with me. Uh, so we'll start off, everybody's heard this, right? You've heard Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. But the real question is, I wonder just how hot you are. We already know what stars are. Our big question is how hot the stars are because that determines their life cycle. So stars have different colors. Okay. Why? Why do they have different colors? There's a hint on the screen already. By the way, all of my talks are audience participation, so if somebody doesn't say something, I'm just going to stare at you for a minute. Is it what they burn? It does have to do somewhat with what they burn and how hot they burn. Right? It's the temperature that actually helps determine the color, but the temperature is determined by what's burning at the time, so that is how it links together for all of that. So our different colors do indicate different temperatures. Red stars are cooler than blue stars. Not in the hipster kind of way, but just temperature-wise, they're a little bit cooler. Uh, blue stars tend to be hotter. Um, and we do actually, it turns out, get all of the colors of the rainbow in star form. It is possible. Uh, it's very rare that you see an indigo or violet star, but that's probably because most of the time those stars that would be in that range are actually far enough away that they're receding from us to the point that Doppler shifting has shifted them into the, towards the red part of the spectrum and dropped them out of that. But if we were close to them, we'd actually see them as indigo or violet. It's rare that we get to observe them that way, though. But we do know that the hotter a star is, the faster it's going to burn. So the stars that burn hottest burn out the fastest. So the average energy that we get from a star actually turns out to be that it doesn't vary a whole amount. If you look at the lifespan of the star, the average energy output is not a huge, huge difference because the really hot ones don't burn as long. The cooler ones burn much longer, so over their lifespan, they have a longer lifespan to give out that energy. But what stars come from is really kind of an interesting thing. And so I've, I've got here an image. This is from uh, the Eagle Nebula. It's one of our, our favorite images to show just because people always see things in this image. Anybody see anything bizarre in this image? There's, there's a dog right here, yeah, barking up the tree. Anybody notice the cat that's staring at the dog wondering why the heck he's barking up an empty tree? <laughs> now the thing is, there's not. There's not really a dog there. There's not really a tree or a cat or any. This is actually a piece of a stellar nebula. This span right here from the tip of the dog's nose to his forehead is roughly eight light years. Okay. So eight times the distance light travels in a year. This picture is from a long way off. This is not a close-up. And this stellar nursery is not a close-up. Now, when I show this picture in general to people, they see the dog, they see the cat and the tree, and everything's cool. But what they don't realize is the really, really cool thing is that these two pillars here are nurseries. They're where stars are forming right now. And as you see this light up towards the top, that's a star about to emerge. The star has just formed there and is about to emerge from the tip of that pillar. We know it's about to emerge because we can see the light from it. What happens is the very first stage of the star, it goes into what we call a T tauri stage, and that T tauri stage pushes out huge amounts of radiation pressure, and it actually clears the dust that's around it so that we can get a view of the star. So it, when a star is born, 
what it basically does is it pushes through the crowd and clears out and says, hey, I'm here, look at me, I'm a new star. So that it can cause, the fun part of that is, it causes ripples through the rest of the nebular cloud and starts concentrations for new stars. So the birth of one star is actually the seeds for another star in most cases. So they come from dirty gas clouds. These, these gas clouds, they, they provide gas and dust, which is really what makes up a star. Now it is not this kind of dust. That is actually a rather good magnification of dust found under uh, one of my former professor's couches. Uh, that's not the stuff that's making up our dust. When we say stardust or the, that they're formed from gas and dust, what we're talking about is particles of rock, uh, particles of some of the heavier elements depending on what stage star we're dealing with. Uh, the gases we're talking about, hydrogen and helium are in large quantities and those are our main constituents for the beginnings of stars. Uh, but we're not really talking when we say it's, it's a form from a dust cloud. I get a lot of students when I say that, that you know, they're wondering, well, does that mean if I go punch a hole in the vacuum, I can create a star? No, you can't do that, and it's not recommended. But the gas and dust cloud is necessary for the formation of a star. Uh, generally, as it says there, our, our grains are carbon or silicon, uh, as opposed to hair and other fibers that we think of as dust. When we look at a star, the light from a star, we generally will see a single color from the star. But if we take it and split it into the spectrum that it's emitting, what we see are lines within the spectrum. Those lines indicate actually elements that are present in the spectrum of the star. That's actually how we tell what stars are made of. Because it's really inconvenient to try and go scoop a piece of star out. Uh, the next, anybody know where the, how close the nearest star is to us? Four light years. Actually, there's one closer than that. One astronomical unit, <laughs> or approximately 93 million miles. We call it the sun, yes. Ah, I'm sorry, he, he was going with the grander us. It's okay. So yeah, our closest star is actually the sun. It is a, a actually slightly below average star. Sorry, All right, we, we used to think we were really special, but it turns out we're slightly below average. Um, <laughs> But the next closest after that is approximately four light years away. Uh, and so that star, obviously, we would not be able to go scoop a piece out of to figure out what it's made of. So what we do is we simply take the light, we spread it out into the spectrum, and we look for these lines, and then compare them to the lines that are emitted by heated gases, and that allows us to determine what elements are present. Now the dark lines that you see in this spectrum are actually where the light from the star has passed through a dust cloud or a gas cloud and it's actually absorbed some of the light so we can tell what's happening in between by the dark lines and what's coming out of the star by the bright lines. So we get two pieces of information from one piece of evidence. Normally when we're doing this type of spectral analysis, this is actually a little bit small for looking at it. Uh, I have seen some of our, our labs where we're doing this analysis where they'll actually spread, spread the spectrum such that a, you could start it at this corner and it would stretch all the way to that corner of the room so that they can spread it out enough to see all the individual lines to pick out all the different elements that are present. Uh, it just makes it easier to see if you spread it out more. But my screen is only so big, so I didn't do that. We do find that our sun has a reasonably varied amount of material. It's mostly hydrogen, which we expect in most stars. Uh, that says actually that it's in the first stage of its life cycle, that it's mostly hydrogen. It's converting hydrogen to helium in its first stage. Uh, but we do have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and iron, which tells us that our star is not one of the first stars either. The fact that these heavier elements are present, anything heavier really than hydrogen and helium, says that we're at least a second generation star because the only way to get these heavier elements is to form them in the nucleus of a previous star. That's how we get iron, is actually the final stage of the largest type of star. And so the way to get iron into your star 
is to make it from the gas cloud that was created when an older star blew up. And so we know we're at least a second generation star, which also helps tell us a better idea of what we really think the age of our universe or our, our solar system, well, our solar system, the age we get from the way our, our star is burning and how much helium and hydrogen we have, but the age of our universe, if we know how long this has been burning and we know that a previous one that had to be bigger had to blow up before this one could form, that starts giving us, pushing back our date for when the start of the universe was, which is another piece of why we're studying all of this. So they all begin with a slow gathering of gas and dust because gravity works. We like that. Gravity always works. We have not yet found a case where it doesn't work. No, we do not have a room anywhere that we can turn it off, contrary to popular belief. It's always there, and we know from Newton, we have this rule of universal gravitation that says, not only does it always work, but it extends out infinitely, and that it depends on the mass of two objects being attracted over the square of their distance, because the square of their distance can never get to zero, we never get a point where we run out of the farther away they are, it gets smaller, but it never goes to zero. Contractions do happen in stars. They actually do vibrate. And by looking at the vibrational rates, we are actually able to determine a little bit more about the structure and the internal processes, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. So we need nuclear fusion. The good news is, as they start to form, the more mass that clumps together, that raises one of these two M's, which means the force gets bigger, so it pulls more on more stuff and starts collecting in more. So the bigger it gets, the more it pulls in. So it sort of becomes the neighborhood bully and yanks in everything it can grab until all of that stuff squishing together, the frictional forces caused by the gravitational compression increase the temperature to the point of the ignition point for nuclear fusion. At 15 million degrees Celsius, which happens right in the center of the star, nuclear fusion begins. Okay. This is hydrogen fusion. We take four hydrogen nuclei, we get a helium, two positrons, two neutrinos, and energy. Okay. Who figured that out? More importantly, who figured out how we're getting the energy out? Anyone? Einstein, right. So it turns out that the mass of the four hydrogens is greater than the mass of one helium. And yes, it was our buddy Einstein who figured that out. That's my favorite picture of him. Absolute favorite picture of him. In his famous equation, E equals mc squared, which is probably one of the more misquoted physical equations, but for our sakes, we'll leave it at E equals mc squared for now. There's actually supposed to be a rest mass in there, and we won't get into all of that. But the idea is, when the fusion happens, what we started with was more massive than what we end with, and that extra mass is converted to energy and released in that fusion reaction. So as that fusion reaction, as that energy is released, it pushes outward. At the same time, gravity is pulling inward. So we now have a battle going on. The energy radiation pressure wants to push out, the gravity wants to pull in, so it creates an equilibrium point, but fluctuations in the rate of the fusion reaction cause fluctuations in the outward push. Gravity pretty much stays constant, but what that means is that the star will pulse. And by looking at the rate of pulse, we can actually look at the fluctuation rate of the nuclear reaction in the center of the star, which just boggled my mind the first time someone told me that. But stars actually will ring like bells almost. They vibrate almost that regularly in some cases. So yeah, I said before, new stars, they're not quiet. Okay, as soon as the stars form, and you can see here an expulsion of gas from a young binary star system, meaning that we've got two stars that formed. And you can see these plumes of gas that are coming out here. 
over the course of from 95 to 2000. And you'll notice that the stretch, the distance, these all, all of these images are on the same scale exactly. That change in height, well you can see the scale there, 200 astronomical units about in spread in that five year period. So the stuff they kick out is moving. It's, it's not slow. You do not want to be next to a newly formed star. Or actually you won't stay next to it. It will push you away fairly quickly. I thought I said hand, sorry. So all the stars have different colors, which means they have different temperatures. So the next thing that we had to do once we realized that was figure out a way to classify them. And so the person that helped us out the most with that is a, a woman by the name of Annie Jump Cannon. Uh, Annie Jump Cannon uh, was actually born partially deaf, uh, but she is one of the few of her time that actually managed to push past secretary level in science for her age, uh, for her, her time period. She actually, <laughs> the, the funny thing is, what she's famous for was actually doing a secretarial type job. But because she did that job, she got promoted up to the level of scientist because what she did, along with a group of other uh, women, was classify stars on photographic plates. What we did was took telescopes, they took color film photographic plates, they took pictures of stars through the telescopes. And then the plates were handed off to the women headed by Annie Cannon. And what they did was they went and looked at each plate and at each star and figured out what color and what size, based on the magnification that they were told for their image, what size the star was and what color the star was. And they classified all of the stars on these plates and created a catalog of stars that is, is somewhat eye-watering. Uh, they classified something over 25,000 stars. But by doing that, it allowed us to see trends. This is an, an image of one of those photographic plates. My understanding is actually, while she started out partially deaf, by the time she was done with all these photographic plates, she was also partially blind from staring at all of them so long. But it allowed us to see trends in what's going on and to create a special diagram called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, named for the two gentlemen who took Annie Jump Cannon's catalog and looked for the trends in her information. And we see this interesting sequence. We have what's, what we call the main sequence of stars. Most stars fall somewhere along this line. And then we have this grouping of stars over here, the red giants, and a group down here, the white dwarfs. If we look at the scales on this, we have luminosity, so how bright they are on the vertical scale, and temperature on the horizontal scale, but you've got to look very closely at this. You'll notice that unlike most graphs that you were taught to do in high school, up through high school, this is not zero, zero. Hotter is here, colder is here. We did go from zero upward in terms of luminosity. But what that tells us is that our bluer stars, our hotter stars, are also brighter, which makes a certain amount of sense. But then they wondered, well, what happens to get us into this region or this region? And it turns out that these are end stages for stars. Now you'll see here we have the sun labeled, actually, I really need to get a better uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram because the sun it looks like it's this X right here, and it's not, it's this one. We're slightly below average. So we're just below the line of the main sequence. Uh, but we're right in the middle range, which means that our star should last for a middling amount of time. Roughly 10 billion years. We're roughly 4.6 to 5 billion years into the life cycle. So we've got somewhere around five billion more years before our sun does anything interesting, other than give us light, which is very interesting. But beyond that, we don't have to stress too much about what's going to happen when the sun runs out of fuel and moves to the next stage, because 
I'm not planning to be here in five billion years. I don't know about you guys, but I'm done after at least 100,000. <laughs> so let's get into the two basic life cycles, because there really are two life cycles depending on the size of the star. We have the sun-like stars, which go through a life cycle on this side, and we have the massive stars, which are the ones that get really interesting and do the stuff that everybody gets excited about. In both cases, <laughs> We actually start here in the middle with the gas dust cloud. So we have our gas dust cloud, gravity works, we start clumping things together, we start nuclear fusion, and then we start getting interesting depending on how much clumped together before the nuclear fusion started. That's the big key. How fast did it get stuff pulled in before fusion started? Because once fusion starts, you don't get to clump much back in because that radiation pressure starts blowing all the things out farther away in that T tori stage. So a red giant, which is probably going to be the end cycle for our star, but one that you actually know about or probably have heard about. Anybody know which red giant I'm referring to? Beetlejuice. Now if somebody says it a third time, he shows up, right? Oh, okay. I just dated myself. Nobody knows that, that movie anymore except for the old people like me. Okay. So, <laughs> to give you an idea, idea though, this star, this red giant, is about this big. Our Earth's orbit around the Sun is about this big. The size of Jupiter's orbit is about this big. This red giant came from a star roughly the size of our Sun. Stop and think about this for a moment. When it goes to red giant, it will be roughly this big. Our orbit around the sun is this big. Jupiter's orbit is only this big. The outer edges of that red giant will be beyond the orbit of Jupiter. This is one of the reasons we're interested in seeing about developing technologies that will take us farther than Earth orbit. Because in that five billion years, if we're not beyond the orbit of Jupiter, we will be inside the shell of the red giant, which will not be as comfortable as it sounds. So for our solar sty type stars, after the helium is exhausted, the fusion stops. You run out of fuel, you stop the process. Just like your cars, when they run out of gas, they stop working. When the star runs out of hydrogen gas, it stops fusing hydrogen into helium, because you just can't fuse it if it's not there. So that radiation pressure stops and gravity takes over so the star starts collapsing. It heats up because it's collapsing and friction is pressing things together. So what happens because it heats up is it actually, because it drops down very quickly and heats it up, it causes a burst of energy that pushes the outer layers outward and as they expand outward, expansion is a cooling process and what color is colder? Red. So it starts turning red as it expands outward. But it expands outward, this gas cloud expands outward beyond the size of the original star, so we call it a giant, and it becomes a red giant. And eventually breaks up into what we call a planetary nebula. Now here's the really, really disturbing part to me. A planetary nebula makes it sound like this is the thing that planets form from, right? No, it's the thing that more stars can form from. But stars get to form, or planets get to form from whatever's left over with the stars formed, so they call it a planetary nebula. We have here a uh, Hubble image of the ring nebula, uh, which is a star that has exploded outward and is, has reached the point that it's broken up and is no longer classed as a red giant because that outer expansion has stretched too far and just like a balloon that's overinflated, it pops and breaks out into the gas cloud that we see now as the ring nebula. Uh, this is another nebula, planetary nebula, NGC, is that 3132? Yes, 3132. I have no idea what direction you would need to look for that, but then again, it changes because the Earth keeps spinning, so don't worry about it. And there's the very last stage that is a nebular galactic cluster where we actually have multiple stars in one area that have exploded 
and left behind gas dust clouds that will eventually form into at least second, if not third generation stars. Uh, we're still waiting to see once they create a star, then they give off enough light that we can spread out the spectrum and figure out what's present and figure out what stage or what generation of star they were. What's left behind is the white dwarf. Okay, it's the center of the planetary nebula. It's that little bit that was at the core that didn't explode outward. That's not really the white dwarf. I just like to mess with people. Uh, it is something that is roughly the size of Earth with an approximate mass of the sun. Because that outer layer that blows out is really not that much of the star that blows out. So we, we kind of give the analogy that it's a, about a ton per teaspoon which means you've got to get a really strong teaspoon. The inward force of gravity now is balanced out by the repulsive force of the electrons in the atoms. And that stops it from collapsing any further, but it also means that it's going to radiate energy outward and eventually cool off and become a brown dwarf, which is just simply a white dwarf that's lasted long enough to not be putting out any more heat, not still be heated up from that initial collapse. And it looks a little bit more like this than that original picture. You do not actually normally have these lines. The crossed lines there are actually an artifact of the magnification. Uh, it's the same effect as if you have a, when you look through your windshield and it needs to be washed at night and you see these pretty headlights that have the star shape. <laughs> same basic thing has happened with our, because of the level of magnification in order to see that image uh, we couldn't clean the lens enough to not have the lines show up. So for the massive stars, what they do is go through a process. They start off non-burning hydrogen, then we get hydrogen fusion, they're roughly this size, then they collapse down and they've still got enough mass that they reach the ignition temperature for helium fusion. Helium fuses into carbon. If they're big enough, when they run out of helium, they start to collapse again, but they reach the ignition temperature for carbon fusion, and that takes them to oxygen. And if they're big enough still, that ends and they take it to neon, then to magnesium, to silicon. Finally, we reach iron. Iron is it. You cannot go higher than iron in the periodic table inside a star. The reason for that is that once you get to iron, the fusion reaction that happens for iron actually takes more energy than it gives. It turns out that the end product is more massive than the original product, which means you have to add extra energy in and nobody's in there pouring extra energy into the star, so iron is it. That's the best we can do. But then it gets unstable and all sorts of fun things happen. So there's succession of elements, iron, as I said, is the most stable element. It cannot be fused further. Instead of releasing energy, it requires energy for that fusion. But it's still unstable. Okay. So what happens? Supernova. It, the instability reaches a point where it simply explodes. And we get this huge, bright image, puts out huge amounts of radiation, extreme luminosity, for a brief period of time as it basically destroys the star and breaks everything up into dust-sized particles that can be later incorporated into stage two stars. Remember, our sun has iron in it, which means a supernova happened before our sun formed. And our sun formed from the leftover stuff from the supernova explosion. Okay. Supernova remnants from, this is supernova 1987A. Okay, what that designation means is that it was first noticed in 1987 and it was the very first one that year because it's A. The second one, anybody want to guess? B, right. We're very good at following sequences at NASA, so we try that. Uh, but you can see the optical image here from February 2000 for this explosion. It exploded in 90, 1987, but we're actually seeing material that was ejected from the star thousands of years before it exploded into supernova. 
the optical, the light energy reaches and lights up that outer stuff that was blown out already. And so we get to see a, an optical ring of illumination. And then over time, radio, x-ray, and then we see the shock wave from the supernova itself, from the explosion itself, which moves slower than the speed of light. That shock wave finally reaches that outward expelled material and starts creating little density pockets. And what happens when we get little density pockets? They start pulling more stuff in and start creating new stars. So that supernova explosion starts creating the next set of stars. Here's the supernova remnants from Cassiopeia A in the optical and the x-ray. We often find a lot more information looking outside of the visible spectrum. And this is because really when you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light is like 2% of what's out there. So if we limit ourselves to optical telescopes, we limit ourselves to looking at 2% of the information available. So we need these other telescopes. That's why we keep building these different telescopes that have different parts of the spectrum like the, the James Webb telescope, which will actually be an infrared telescope and allow us to see in a section of the infrared spectrum and an, a section of the history of our uh, solar system and universe that we've never been able to look at before because we didn't have instruments that were sensitive to that part of the spectrum. And that's what we're trying to do with these. So elements that come out of the supernova explosions are the heavier elements. It turns out that that explosive capacity provides the extra energy to create the heavier elements. So we get all the way up to uranium can actually be created in a supernova explosion. So what's left? If the mass of what's at the core is a little bit smaller than five times the mass of our sun, it will collapse down until electrons and protons are squished together to form neutrons and we get a neutron star. That's something roughly 10 kilometers across with more mass than the sun, roughly five times the mass of the sun, but only 10 kilometers across. Okay, for reference, I think that might make it smaller than Troy from end to end, but five times the mass of the sun. So it's fairly high density, way over a ton per teaspoon. If the mass of the core is greater than five times a solar mass, even the repulsion of neutrons or the compacted neutrons cannot keep the collapse from happening. And so the surface collapses and the density increases to the point that the escape velocity from the surface is greater than the speed of light. When that happens, we have a black hole. What's going on inside a black hole? No idea. By definition, we're not allowed to know. Because everything that we know comes from studying the electromagnetic spectrum. Every part of the electromagnetic spectrum travels at the speed of light. Everything inside the event horizon of the black hole is not traveling fast enough to get out. So therefore, we cannot have any information from the black hole. The best we can say is, there's a black hole. So how do we find that black hole? Do we just look for spots where there's no light? No, actually we look for spots where there's a lot of x-ray emissions and nothing in the middle to create the x-ray emissions. Because it turns out that the, the gradient of gravity, the way the gravity changes as you approach that event horizon, gets so extreme that as a, if a human being were to be falling foot first towards the event horizon of the black hole, the difference in gravity from their feet to the top of their head would be on the order of eight magnitudes of difference. So if it's one at the feet, it's one with eight zeros at the head. Actually, let's go the other way. If it's one at the head, it's one with eight zeros at the feet. And so that stretches things out. And I, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you've probably heard of him before, he, he came up with this wonderful, wonderful term for this process. It's called spaghettification. Because essentially it stretches you out like a spaghetti noodle. And eventually that stretching overcomes anything you can do and you end up being converted to energy. 
primarily in the X-ray spectrum, and so we get a ring of X-ray emissions with nothing that we can see in the middle causing them. It's because the X-ray emissions are actually the ring of, of material falling past the event horizon of the black hole. The really cool thing is, according to the mathematics of special relativity, time dilates as you get into higher gravitational fields. So if you could fall into the black hole right at the event horizon, time for you would appear to speed up. As we observed you, your time would stop. But as you observed, you'd be able to observe the entire rest of the history of the universe as you were falling across, assuming, of course, that your eyeballs hadn't been turned to pure energy yet. So it's kind of an interesting thing. We're, we're still trying to figure out how do we get this information? How do we not spaghettify? We don't know yet. We're still working on those things. Sometimes we'll get what we call a pulsar. They were first discovered in 1967 by Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Yes, another woman in science. I like to see women in science. We now know that they are rotating neutron stars with jets of energy that are basically giving us the lighthouse effect. It happens that these jets of energy come out as it spins around, they're coming out and they're spinning around with it. And basically just like a lighthouse, as it flashes across, we get a flash of energy. But they happen, we get these flashes very regularly. And unfortunately, when they first discovered them in 1967, it was determined that there was no way that nature could possibly send out a signal that was that regular. So if there's no way that nature could possibly send out a signal that's that regular, what's left? Say it out, aliens. It's got to be an alien signal coming to us. We actually thought they were communications from space. That's actually why in one of the catalogs, they have the designation LGM for pulsars. Because we finally figured out what they were and realized, no, they're not aliens trying to communicate with us. They're just spinning neutron stars. But LGM is the astronomers mocking themselves. Stands for little green men. So the supernova, or the, the pulsar designation LGM was a, the scientists saying, okay, we got it wrong. We thought it was the little green men, but it wasn't. <laughs> So we get up, up close and personal with the black hole, we get some interesting things. We have the accretion disk where mass is starting to fall in. We have sometimes jets that come from the center of the black hole and black holes do rotate as well. So sometimes those jets will actually look like pulsars except they'll look more in the X-ray than in the visible light or in the radio spectrum. Then we have the event horizon. That's the point of no return. At the event horizon, the escape velocity is the speed of light. Inside the event horizon, it's greater than the speed of light. So the event horizon is the best possible hope that we could get and still get information out, but even there, no. You gotta be a little farther out than that and hope you're not spaghettified. And then we believe what we call a singularity exists deep in the center. Uh, singularity being basically <laughs> Something that happens that we do not understand in our universe. Uh, my, my favorite description of a singularity uh, comes from Einstein. He said, a singularity is basically where God divided by zero. And just freaked everything out. We also get things called quasars, or quasi-stellar radio objects. First found in the early 1960s, we think they are actually supermassive black holes. Not the band, but the actual existence. Light is emitted due to material spiraling into that black hole, being converted to energy. And so it acts like a radio stellar object, but it's not a star, it's a black hole. It's not emitting any other light. It's the accretion disk around the black hole that's doing that. Okay. We now know that many are not actually radio bright. So while we call them quasars still, which has this nice radio word, meaning that it, the first ones found were bright in the radio spectrum, it turns out most of them actually aren't bright in the radio spectrum, but we still call them quasars because tradition. So 
So from there, the supernova explosion compresses the gases. It starts the collapse of gas and dust, and we start new stars, and we end up going all the way back to the beginning. How we know some of this, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, uh, which looks in the X-ray part of the spectrum and sees those accretion disks. The Spitzer Space Telescope has been helping us get this information. But all of it brings us right back to where we started, starting with new stars at the end of the black hole or at the end of that supernova explosion. And that really is the life cycle of stars. The rest of it is talking about what, how do we group stars together, which really doesn't happen anyway. So what I'd like to do is open it up for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yes, sir? We talked about this before you started your presentation. This new supernova that they discovered that doesn't burn out, what could cause it to keep burning and not burn out? So for those of you in the back that may not have heard, he's asking about, uh, there's a recent discovery that we seem to have found a supernova that's not getting dimmer. It's not burning out, and he's wondering what could cause that to happen. And the answer is, we have no idea right now. We're very, very confused by that, because it should have gotten dimmer by now. Uh, so they're right now rushing to try and figure out what's going on with it. We, we honestly, we don't know what could cause it to still be so bright, except possibly that it was really, really massive. But even that, it just doesn't, something's not right in what we're seeing. So we're still figuring it out. May I ask one more question? Sure. This two-story building that is a camera in California, I believe, what can they do by making a, a camera that's two stories high? What will they find they can't find with ordinary telescopes? So he's, he's asking about there's, a, there's a, an essentially a two-story tall camera building that's a camera uh, out in California, and he's wanting to know what can we find from that that you can't find from conventional telescopes. Uh, the big piece to that is that it allows us to do much more, uh, much stronger magnifications and still block external disturbances in the air. One of the biggest problems we have with ground-based telescopes is the more you magnify, the more the disturbance of just air moving affects your image. And so by building a two-story building that is the tube of the, of the camera, essentially, we can set a magnification in that space where we can control the air flow. And so it allows us, hopefully, to get sharper images. We still have to contend with the atmosphere above the building, but we don't have to contend with atmospheric effects in between the uh, magnification and the actual objective lens. Yes, sir. Uh, I forget the name of the scientist that worked with uh, Canon that used the uh, spectroscopy, you know, to analyze the stars. But what were the ideas of the of what stars were before? Um, were they like hot planets or something? There, there have been a, several ideas, but yeah, the the main runner idea we really thought stars early on. Well, if we go way back, stars were actually placed there in memoriam. Uh, by earlier gods, but we're going to ignore that one. Um, then, <laughs> then it was a point of stars, they, they still had the idea that maybe our sun was a star, but we really didn't understand what was going on before we had these images and could start to spread the spectra. So they were trying to figure out, yes, the idea of, of we know that Jupiter actually is large enough and massive enough that it puts off more heat than it takes in from the sun. And so one of the ideas was, okay, maybe they're just supermassive planets, essentially, and they're radiating out more heat due to gravitational heating. Uh, it wasn't until much later that we figured out the fusion process. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago, the Hubble Wide Field Telescope took a fascinating picture of hundreds of millions of galaxies and even 1300 What is that? Are we looking back in time? I mean, is that way back to the beginning? So to repeat his question for those in the back, uh, 
several years ago, we had an image come out from the Hubble Space Telescope called the wide field image. And we actually now have the ultra wide field image, which is even more fun. Uh, but basically, uh, what they did to make that image was they picked a spot in the sky that was roughly the size of a nickel held out at arm's length that was totally dark in the sky. We pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at that spot for 48 hours. We just kept it trained on that one spot and collected all of the light that we could from that one spot for 48 hours and then took all of that light and used computers to generate an image. What we found was in that totally dark spot that from our naked eye was totally dark the size of a nickel, there were a couple hundred thousand galaxies. Not just stars, but galaxies. And yes, they are extremely far away, and that's why we can't see them naked eye, because the light coming in, we blink too fast and we reset. That's what your blinking does, is it resets the camera of your eye. So if we could have just held our eyes open for 48 hours and stared at that spot, theoretically, we might have seen some of those galaxies, but in reality, no. It just won't work that way. But so we were, but we were seeing these things because they're so far away, we were, were actually looking back in time to an earlier time of our universe because the farther away you look, because the speed of light is a constant, the farther away the light is coming from, the, farther, the longer ago the light started coming towards us. So yes, every one of those galaxies that we see in that image is actually in our distant past history. So I think the closest galaxy they established was somewhere on the order of 100,000 light years away, so we were looking, that, that dot of light, we were looking at something that was what it looked like 100,000 years ago. And have they imaged other, I mean, so, so we've, we we've take another look and we're going to get more galaxies? The, the idea is we assume that it's, we assume what we call homogeneity and that in any direction if we were to do that we would see the same kind of thing. Uh, the big problem we have with doing that is you have to aim at a spot that doesn't already have something that you can see naked eye because otherwise all of that light coming in will burn a hole or a, a spot on the, the charge couple device that is the camera for the Hubble and it would basically give it a blind spot that as we moved around we'd have, you know, like dust on the windshield all the time. Okay. So one more. Sure. What's the Webb telescope going to do for us? Uh, the James Webb Telescope is uh, looking into the infrared spectrum. So it's, it's actually designed, one of the biggest things that we had to figure out how to do was build a heat shield for it because infrared is associated with thermal energy and we have this really big source of thermal energy out there, we like to call it the sun, that would overwhelm everything we were trying to look at because we're trying to look in the very distant infrared. So what we first had to do was figure out a way to build a shield. The, sun sh the solar shield for the Webb telescope is roughly the size of a tennis court. And it's multiple layers of material to block the sunlight and the thermal energy. And then we have a series of mirrors that are uh, actually covered in gold foil to make them highly reflective for thermal or infrared uh, light. And they're then focusing onto a small infrared camera that will take the imagery. Uh, the fun part, once we built that or figured that out, was figuring then out how to fold it up to fit inside a rocket. Because most of our rockets aren't the size of a tennis court. So we actually went to, uh, believe it or not, we, <laughs> we went to origami experts and learned how to fold the James Webb Space Telescope's thermal shields uh, as origami so that it will fit inside the, the top of the spacecraft. And then once it is finally launched and is in position, the fairing will open and it will actually unfold the origami into the tennis court size shield. And I'm waiting for that to actually happen. We haven't launched that telescope yet, but when it starts unfolding, it's going to be impressive. We hope. Either way, people are going to be impressed. We're just hoping it's that good impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, what we do really is rocket science. <laughs> so it's difficult. And a lot of times, nobody's ever done it before. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. We always get some sort of data. Sometimes the data is, don't do that. 
Any other questions I can answer? Oh, one more. And then you. Okay, so his, his question for those who couldn't hear was, a couple of days ago we released a, an image of a sunset from Mars and the sky appeared to be blue and during the day it appears to be red and why is that different from Earth? And it has to do actually with the chemical composition of the atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is primarily nitrogen, N2 molecules, which the N2 molecule is roughly the size of the blue wavelengths of light and so it preferentially scatters blue light. Basically, if it's about the same size as that wavelength, when it hits, it bounces off in all directions. And so, here on Earth, during the day, that all of those colors coming in from the sun, the blue gets bounced around more, and it enters our eyes, and we see a blue sky. At sunrise and sunset, because of the sharper angle, most of the blue has already been scattered out by the time it gets to us, so what's left behind are the reds and oranges, so they look red and orange. On Mars, the main constituent of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, which is a bigger molecule. It's roughly the size of red wavelengths of light. So during the daytime, it scatters the red, and this daytime sky looks red. But at sunrise and sunset, the red has been scattered out, so it looks blue. So it has to do with the, it actually tells us about the chemical composition of the atmosphere. One more. Yes. Where is the nearest black hole that we research on? Let's see, right now it's about, no, oh, I'm uh, <laughs> It's roughly, I, I want to say it's on the order of tens of light years away. I don't remember the exact number, I apologize, but. What do we use for like, like the data? Uh, we're using the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Uh, we actually do use some of the cameras on the Hubble Space Telescope as well, uh, and the Spitzer. Uh, telescope, and we'll actually look at it with the, uh, the James Webb telescope, but I do, we don't really expect to see a whole lot of new stuff with the James Webb. Do we have time for one more? Sure. Okay. Um, so if that black hole is like coming towards us, uh, if so, do you think that that would end like our Earth before the sun would expand into? Probably not. Uh, in general, something that massive is not going to be moving that fast. Uh, and so if it's, say, 10 light years away, traveling at the speed of light, it would take 10 years to get here. Traveling at the speeds that we currently, that say our sun is, is moving around the center of our galaxy, it would take it somewhere on the order of probably around 6 billion years to get here, which theoretically is just after our sun does its fun things. But again, we're measuring the velocities of it. It's, it's tougher to measure the velocity of a black hole only because we don't get the same shifting off of it. The X-ray emissions are coming out very quickly and so it throws off our estimate of how fast it's approaching. Uh, and sometimes it, we end up actually overestimating the speed with, with which it's moving. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everybody for letting me come and talk to you for a little bit. <laughs>